hold inside. I know my tendency is to uh, become overwhelmed and fragment in a way that sort of shuts me down, or alternately I compensate by being you know, pretty big. And uh, it, it seems like what I'm hearing, what I'm gathering from what you're talking about is that there's a way to try to harness, maybe, or contain these contrasting energies and experiences in order to, uh, I like the word activate, to activate a, a gayness inside that can then, that feels too far, to activate a gayness inside um, that is, that feels internally sourced and enlivening. Does that feel like a part of response to what the, the, the earlier comment? It, it, it seems to me uh, to be a sort of a, a, a version of that for mm -hmm. myself in the moment. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what that might look like for myself out in the world necessarily, mm -hmm. or or what that or what a world might look like mm -hmm. where people are ongoingly partnering and communicating in that sort of in, introverted, I suppose, way. But that's sort of what I take is that what's possible is that these parts of myself that get split off, suppressed, or alternately uh, projected out can somehow communicate with each other and I can sort of hold together around that. And I'm, I'm kind of imagining, just to maybe go a little bit further, that if, if, if people, if, if persons were doing that with an inner violence instead of acting it out, that the world may be a place where we can meet each other more honorably. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a lot. <laughs> You've done a lot of assimilating already. You heard a lot of what I was saying right off the bat. Yeah. Anyone who has a, a similar or different experience from what Kelly was describing? Mine is somewhat similar. I was following along the first Philly? Oh, my name is Philly. Philly. Yeah. First few pages I was fine. I was kind of excited by some ideas. And then I hit a paragraph where I put a question mark and then I lost it. I could not focus. I couldn't stay with it. I didn't know what was... And, and I found myself going back and forth between either um, becoming sort of enraged around and dismissive of this as one way to deal with it. Or feeling terribly, like like Kellen said, um, stupid and inferior, and I just got to accept the fact that I'm never going to get this level to grasp this, and um, can't wait to go to Whole Foods and do my shopping, and like, sorry, just forget about this. Um, and then there's another little part of me too that has a sense that there's something really wonderfully visionary about being gay that I really, really want and need, and I got bits and pieces of that in here too. So that was my experience. What was the point at which you lost it? Did you mark it down or something? Yeah, I did. I put, and when I, that paragraph, I thought, maybe I'll just ask um, Mitch to go back to me, to break this down. But it was on page, um, you know, the, the last part of page five. Imagine that in the beginning of personal existence, a primordial essence, that paragraph. Mm -hmm. uh, on page six. Yeah, that does use some uh, basic uh, Jungian concepts there without full definitions of what the terms are. Uh, I'm using uh, uh, a fair number of concepts, even though it's not a technical language, I'm using technical words, which are not fully introduced because I decided in the end that that would involve so many more words mm -hmm. that it would be way too many words. And I would just take it on faith that if folks listening, not immediately aware of what something was, that uh, these are such basic ideas that over time they would begin to sink in more of what these basic notions might be referencing. It would stimulate the listener to go out and learn more about what such notions are referencing, mm -hmm. kind of thing. Rather than myself be a, a dictionary of basic Jungian terms as I'm trying to read it. I couldn't eliminate all those things. So that's it. You're pointing out a particular paragraph that's fairly concentrated with that kind of introduction. Yeah these uh, basic Jungian sensibilities, which I'm then uh, simply applying in those three sentences. I'm applying that, that Jungian sensibility to the gay phenomenon. 
So it's kind of a mythology of gay personhood here. Mm -hmm. But I guess the mythology I can't quite grasp, because usually I get mythology through stories of gods who did this and that, and here there's mythological imagery coming up that isn't grounded in enough of the story. I'm naming, I'm naming all ideas are myths. All thoughts are myths. All words are myths. All concepts are myths. All what we call reality is a myth. It's all mythical. It's in the Jungian sense. Myth doesn't mean just old stories or something like that. It means the symbolic production of reality. That for human beings, reality is principally symbolic. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's what mythical means. Symbolical, mythical, archetypal, <coughs> analogical, so on. They're all similar words. Uh, they mean a metaphor. They mean that the thing being referred to can only be referred to indirectly through these ways. There's an there's a actuality behind the reference which cannot be named in any other way. Mm -hmm. So mythical is used in that sense. It's referring to real things, but that cannot be apprehended directly. Only through mythic experience, mythological, meaning symbolic meaning. So I'm using the word myth in that sense, a symbol. You know, in the sense of a fairy tale or something. And, or we could turn that around. And everything we think, everything we know, everything we consider is a fairy tale. There's nothing else. Nothing else. It's all fairy tales. It's all mythical. We swim in an ocean of symbols. We breathe symbols. That's all there is in human nature, is symbolic reality. So it's how to work within symbols. There's no escape. It's not like some of them are not going to be symbolically mythical. Everything is mythical. And that's since everything is a narrative, everything is telling a story. Even if we say we're postmodern deconstructionists, well, there is no meaning. That's a story. That's a narrative story. There are always stories. Everything is a story. There's no escape from it. See? So that's the general atmosphere of what I'm, I'm, I'm doing and using those kinds of words. Let's fill you on a little more. Yeah. It's understandable that, that you or some of the rest of you may have this reaction of feeling kind of dumb to it. For, for various reasons. One, one is uh, this point here, uh, that I'm, I'm, I'm doing a concentrated use of these terms. If you're not f modestly familiar with these basic terms and how I'm using them, uh, a lot of it will just kind of pass right over, which is okay. It's all right just to get the general sensibility. Even though it's packed with particularities, they don't need to be all grasped. And, and the failure to grasp them all, notice how that provokes the shadow, both of you. The failure to grasp it or failure to figure out everything becomes a, a narcissistic comparison number. You know, I must be inferior or I must be superior kind of thing. You know, and all those shadow issues are, are provoked. Which if one can relate to it, that's very good. It's better when shadow stuff is provoked if one can struggle to have a conscious engagement with what's being provoked. All right, yeah. I just wanted to add to that that um, one of the things I was noticed is that there was a real emphasis on the word wholeness. And it seems like there's this important idea that to achieve wholeness, we have to tolerate that. We have to learn to come to experience and tolerate that shadow reaction. So, uh, anyone else who um, had some? Yes, Bryce? Um, well, first of all, physically, I'm Shaking actually right now. Mm -hmm. um, I so much of our Yeah, yeah, very electrified uh, feeling right now. Um, uh, I I also had a, a point where my feelings changed during the course of the talk uh, when you started talking about uh, childhood and giving this very rich picture of uh, of the experience of falling in love with daddy and, and seeing his dick and feeling incredible desire. And, and actually, it was it was uh, for me as I was taught, as I was listening, uh, uh, I felt like uh, it was this thing that I want, and that it's it's like it's right there. It's almost like when you're talking, you're holding out Daddy's dick in front of me, <coughs> and I so uh, I feel so incredibly small and inferior, and so that's what the shaking is. It's like. I'm like in torture in a way because I want it so badly. When you're talking about the ladder and the seven stages, it's like the more delineated it is, the more the more um, you think through and imagine and, and then share uh, here. And I hear that vision. The more it, uh, it's like activated, I get around wanting it. And it and um, just to relate it kind of to uh, what you were saying earlier, that for for me was where I. 
but now I'm feeling I'm feeling toxic shame because I'm trying to engage with with uh, with you. Uh, fragmenting uh, that that I, I actually felt like you you did talk a lot about homosexual potential if that if that was what you were referring to very in in very you know specific and rich ways but that actually that was when I had the hardest time listening um, and I think it was precisely because that's what I want so much and I feel so much pain around not having that but that's actually where I have the hardest time taking in, and yet I did take in mm. a, a lot, but it's mm. just electrifying me now, which I'm glad. It's a lot, It seems like there's a theme developing around a paradox of both intense, dark, painful feeling, and then also getting inspired. Um, other feelings or reactions? Thomas. Yeah, Thomas. Um, also, I kind of had the reaction, like, you know, this is so hot and so trippy and so inspiring, and, and these ideas and thoughts and visions are like, just, wow, you know. And, and as I'm sitting there, and even now as I'm sitting here, I'm realizing that everything that I, I'm working through, you know, in therapy and in my own inner work is, is what has kept me from having that kind of a vision and from being able to imagine being gay that way, you know, and it's like, it's like I'm constantly being <coughs> thwarted around being able to hold on to that. And I was aware of that, like listening to you, it's like, I want to hold on to these ideas, and it gets yanked out of me, <coughs> yanked away from me. And I just feel that's you know, so much of a, I mean, living in a, such a heterosexist world, a public world, and just my own personal trauma about being gay is, is related to that too. Mm -hmm. You certainly bring up the point that uh, uh, repetition is very important for any type of retraining pattern, and we're talking about appreciating and valuing homosexuality and gay meaning rather than devaluing it. it must be repeatedly uh, reinforced over and over and over, not just in terms of uh, counteracting the constant bombardment of, of anti-homosexuality out there, but all the terrible history we carry within us from families that I'm sure would be extremely rare if any of us uh, grew up in a family that respected being homosexual. Child. I, at best, just blank about it, you know, and it goes downhill from there. So how could we not have to face uh, kind of relearning what our roots are as being homosexual and then losing it and relearning it and losing it and relearning it each increment? Maybe it's a little better constituted, a little better connected with, a little better grown inside. If it gets forgotten again, it's an education. Oh, uh, the next time I'll learn a little bit better. And have faith in the cycle rather than just get caught in the down part of losing that connection. I can appreciate the bigger picture. Uh, I think the sign when one goes backward like that, uh, that one is ready to then go forward again. So here again, I'm combining that idea of the dark and the light together. Rather than the dark is only there to block the light. There would be no light without the dark. And there'd be no advancement in the light if there was not disadvancement from feeling like shit. Two together make a cycle, and it's those two that become integrated in the greater wholeness that can tolerate that without being destroyed by it. That's the new level I was referring to. It's very doable, but only through uh, enormous patience and effort and persistence. It's like the diamond and the on diamonds. Uh, such a rarity must be paid for in blood. Of suffering, the blood of challenge, the blood of, of constantly feeling like one is losing or failing that, but not just failing that. Yeah. I'm sorry, hold on just a second. She, she went out her hand up early. Uh, well, my name is Sheila. Okay. And uh, my little Vita is all jingly jangly. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and also, a, the shadow part that came up for me was, I was like, oh, we know that. But, it's, but it felt like scaffolding around intuition. So uh, that was my reaction. I guess my shadow is arrogance. 
Arrogance? The arrogance. Mm -hmm. no. Not an inferior reaction for you. <laughs> wow. Hmm. Hello? Um, yeah, I really, um, my back is, is, was sort of out tonight. I had a lot of phlegm in my, in my, in my throat. And I was trying not just to go into a hacking fit earlier. <laughs> And as the, as the talk went on, I found, I felt myself calming down and, and really getting into it. But somewhere around the time when you were talking about the, the Ka and the seven stages, from uh, like subsistence to splendor and, and radiance, I just really activated with shame. It was like, God, I'm just barely subsisting. <laughs> You're like, hacking and hobbling and fucking around.